We've got two problems to go over here that are sort of representative, or not representative, but they encompass most of the work that we've done so far. Here we have a motor and gearing problem with incremental motion. We're given that the motor armature moment of inertia is 0.1, the number of teeth on gear 1 is 40, the number of teeth on gear 2 is 200. These gears have moments of inertia, 0.1 and 2.5 respectively. This is 2.5. And we have a mass on a conveyor belt. So the, the drums for the conveyor belt, they have moment of inertia of 5 each. Their radii or is uh, 2. And we have three a um, box of mass 3 resting on a conveyor belt. So what we want to do is move the box 20 units in 0.7 seconds. No, in 1 second. Hmm. Okay, so 20 units in one second. And we also have a load torque, which is opposing this motion. So you could think of that as dry friction, for example. Now we are going to start out by finding the motor torque for all three parts of this trapezoidal velocity profile. And we're given that the, prof the total motion takes one second. We accelerate for 0.2 seconds. We stay constant acceleration or constant velocity for 0.5, and then we decelerate in 0.3 seconds. So, first of all, let's find the equivalent system where we have uh, shown in this diagram, sort of, the motor torque acting on an equivalent moment of inertia, and then a uh, torque that's resisting that motion. The Moment of inertia from a box on a conveyor belt is m times r squared, where r is the radius of the drum, so that ends up being 12. And then the equivalent moment of inertia that the motor sees is just ja plus j1 plus the reflected moments of inertia from this drum, this drum, and the mass. So that's n1 over n2 squared, so the number of teeth on the destination shaft divided by the number of teeth on the source shaft, that quotient squared and then the moments of inertia on the uh, source shaft, which is 2 times JC plus JM. And that works out to be 1.08. Now that we have that, we need to get the accelerations. And for the accelerations, they're constant accelerations, so we just need to figure out what this maximum velocity is. Well, since we've reflected things onto the motor shaft, let's find the displacement, the velocity, and the acceleration of the motor shaft. So the, the output shaft here moves a by x desired linear displacement divided by the radius of these drums so that's 20 divided by 2 so 10 radians is how far this shaft turns and that gets multiplied by our gear ratio so we have n2 over n1 times 10 radians 50 radians is how far the motor turns and we have one second then for it to turn 50 radians that displacement is the area under the curve of velocity and time. So if we integrate velocity over time, we get displacement. Since this is a simple shape, that area is just the sum of this triangle and this rectangle and the other triangle. So we have 1 half times 0.2 times omega max plus 0.5 times omega max plus... Let me see if I can make this a little bit easier to read. Okay, we've got a smaller field of view, but uh, hopefully it's clear. One half times 0.3 omega max. All right. So anyway, we just solve for omega max, and we end up getting that it's 66.67 radians per second. Now we're, we have two different rates of acceleration. Alpha 1 is omega max divided by 0.2, so the change in velocity divided by change in time is 333.3 .3, and alpha 2 is the deceleration here and that's 222.2. Uh, I guess we should say specify that this is negative because that will come in into play whenever we deal with um, the torques. Now we have the moment of inertia, effective moment of inertia, JE, and we have the accelerations so we can get the torques by applying Newton's second law to this rotational system. So here's a free body diagram. We have the motor torque going one way, the mass moment of inertia, or, and the uh, torque opposing it going the other way, but that's divided by the gear ratio. Um, so our force balance equation, we have motor torque minus N1 over N2 times tau sub L is equal to this moment of inertia times acceleration. 
and we'll just write that equation, substitute the values for the three cases. So we have tau m1, we have 1.08, which is JE, times alpha 1, plus 1 over 5 times 50, so we get 370 for tau m1. Tau m2, alpha is 0, so we just get 10. Tau m3, here we have negative 222 uh, for the acceleration, so we end up with negative 230 for that torque. RMS torque, here's the equation. It's the duration multiplied by the torque squared for all the different portions and then divide that sum by the total time taken. Take the square root of that quotient and we end up with 249 is the RMS torque for this motion. We're asked to compute the maximum velocity, motor speed, and RPM. So that's just a simple conversion from 666 radians per second to RPM. We get 637 RPM. And the reason we want that is because we are given the voltage constant, Ke, in millivolts per RPM. So here's an expression for the armature voltage, so E sub A, the electromotive potential at the armature, uh, is equal to, at steady state, it's equal to Ra over Kt times the motor torque plus Ke times the motor speed. So we just substitute in the maximum values here for torque and speed, and this occurs at this point here. So it's the highest speed and the highest torque, and we get 22.8 volts uh, will be required by the motor at that point. Now the next problem is this design problem for a pneumatic circuit. We have a cylinder and, okay, so a double acting cylinder. So that's where we'll start with our double acting cylinder. A good place to start is with the actuator. So we have this double acting cylinder. Okay, so double acting has two lines, and the forward stroke is, well, so we're going to control this with a 5-2 valve, that is a 5-2 pilot valve. Now we can go ahead and draw the connections on this valve. So these two are vented and the supply is here. Okay, so whenever this valve is in the position shown, the cylinder is going to be retracted. And when we actuate this side, the valve will go to this position and um, the cylinder extends. So how do we get it to change positions? We have a choice of two buttons. Um, so. For this pilot operated valve, we're going to have two push button actuated valves to supply pressure up here. These are just three two valves with a spring return and a push button actuator. And since we have the choice of two, we're going to have an OR. And that will supply pressure to our pilot operated valve. So now we just need another identical push button valve over here. So when the operator presses either, either of these valves, this 5-2 valve is going to be actuated so that the cylinder extends. Okay, and then to return the cylinder, it's the problem statement says that um, it can be returned by a third push button actuated valve. So the same type of valve is going to control our pneumatically actuated 5-2 valve, but that only works whenever we it also have the cylinder at the end of its stroke. So this is cylinder A, and well, we didn't really need to label that. We've got a 3-2 valve, spring return, but it has a roller actuating it. Uh, 
kind of okay there we go all right so whenever the cylinder goes all the way out it'll press down it'll actuate this valve and move it into this position and then if that's actuated and we press this button then we can get both lines will have high pressure so we but both of those have to be at pressure so we want this and device to provide pressure for our pilot operated valve okay to review you press either of these buttons and we get pressure here which will move the valve the 5-2 valve into this position so that the cylinder will extend and oops uh, I drew these arrows uh, okay I just realized maybe you've been thinking it for a while now then the configuration I have shown uh, it would extend so let's see I really should have had the arrows like this and that and then this is teed and over here they look like that okay so now when it's in when we press through these buttons it'll move to this position which will supply pressure to this chamber on the left the chamber on the right will be vented in that case and so it'll extend once it's extended it will actuate this valve which will supply pressure here if we also press this button to supply pressure here then we get pressure on this line and this valve will be actuated back to return the cylinder to the position shown.